Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Listen and grow as Dell questions the status quo, encourages you to think differently, and empowers you to make a better life. Get ready as Dell challenges core beliefs, seeks the truth, and reveals the roadmap to the lifestyle you really want. And now your host, multi-millionaire, national award-winning investor, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to the Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Today is Tell Dell Tuesday, and we have a wonderful guest here out of Atlanta, Georgia. This gentleman is very interesting because of where he came from out of corporate America to get into the real estate business. So I want to get right into his story. Welcome, Jimmy Mayfield. How are you? Very good, sir. Like I said, I have this personal um, oh, inquisitiveness, I guess is a good way to say it. I always <laughs> ask this question to people. Uh, and there's so many of you guys that have come from the corporate real estate world and got into this and then moved along. And the question I really have for all of them is, you, you know, you started with a master's in real estate at Texas A&M, four years right. consultant yep. in real estate, followed by 22 years of multifamily agency lending. I mean, you were in the center of all this stuff, and yet you didn't do any of it yourself for all those years. What was it about and what is it about being in corporate real estate that sort of doesn't lend itself to seeing the other side, the ownership side. Well, you're you're exactly right, uh, Dale. I, I sort of saw the uh, the strength of real estate and you know the real estate industry from a career perspective, but I was still on the old um, you know W two mindset and didn't really have the you know I didn't really grow up in any sort of entrepreneurial. Um, atmosphere, so I just pursued it as a career, and um, you know, really for the first twelve years um, in in my lending career, I was seeing people do what I'm now doing, and just just didn't really see a way to access it. I wasn't uh, um, I wasn't as outgoing and, and being able to plug into to the syndications I was seeing, you know, one, because they were our customers, that would have been a conflict of interest. But, you know, that's the thing that, that attracted me to Lifestyles was seeing, you know, kind of, you know, kind of the access to people who are just learning what I had seen over the years and were highly interested in, in building a network to do it for themselves. So you did get to see these syndications get produced. You saw how they got produced. Uh, did you get to see any of the good results that many of these things produce, the high rates of return? Was that visible from the outside looking in? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of the refinance deals um, that I was underwriting and, and producing over the years were, you know, were sending millions of people, millions of dollars back to, you know, the, the investors and, and syndicators that, that were our borrowers. So, you know, I saw that uh, – I saw the power of that over the years and didn't really, you know, maybe it took a while for it to dawn on me that, that that's the that, that that's the way to, to get to retirement and to make the switch over to the equity side. But I'm, I'm certainly glad I did. Interesting side story, Jimmy. Um, one of the first members I ever had join up at Lifestyles was an IRS agent. <laughs> he was quite a character. You know, he said, you know, Dell, the reason I'm here, I go, no, what is that? He goes, I, I inspect or he it reviews or whatever it is, tax returns all day long. He said, every person that is rich owns real estate. Everyone that doesn't own real estate isn't that rich. I realized I needed to get into real estate. And so he joined up. I just thought that was kind of an interesting sidelight that he saw it. You see it. It's there. And yet it's just not psychologically accessible to some people, which is interesting. So how did you come to actually find us and get involved in this type of thing? Because you've done great here and uh, retired. And I actually had heard about Lifestyles. We had done some, some deals with, with some Lifestyles members and, and actually in sort of in inspecting a property and visiting with the owners of the property, um, 
in Houston, actually, um, you know, who also had some institutional real estate background. Uh, you know, it turns out we had some some uh, acquaintances in common, um, and they started telling me about lifestyles. And, you know, over lunch, I said, well, you know, I don't know about this lifestyles thing, but I really want to in- invest with you guys. Um, and it, so, well, you have to join lifestyles. So, so I did, and, um, you know, I did the, the, the free introductory workshop, which, you know, r- really – you know, the the magical moment for me there was getting a totally different definition of retirement. Um, and then I sat through, first I watched the two-day online because I was in Atlanta already. Um, and then I came and watched you give it and, and, you know, looking around the room, packed full of people who were, who were um, you know, looking to change their lives. Um, and so I signed up, and I got, uh, you know, immediately in, in the next deal with this couple who were using a different lender, so there was no conflict there. Um, and then I sort of, um, you know, kind of watched for about five years. I thought I was going to be a lead investor, but I, I never could really pull the trigger and leave behind my, you know, pretty well-paying job. So, But the, the big move was in 2017 for me when I when – I, switched my mindset to become a passive investor. Yeah, that was interesting. As uh, I read your bio here, there was a, this, okay, you did a passive deal just to get your feet wet kind of thing. It seems like everybody likes to do that and get your arms around how this actually works. And then you were wanting to become a lead, and you sat on the sidelines for five years waiting to be a lead or something like that. Did I read that right? Yeah, that's that's right, and and you know it kind of never became the right time, and I couldn't get my my mindset um, around the you know burn your ships at the shore, and just, you know I was making <laughs> pretty good money. It was really hard to just step away from that and you know do my first uh, lead investor deal. So the thing that really um, was a catalyst for me actually looking at becoming a lead investor was when was when you know your suggested best practices became rules and suggested that best practices let's uh let's talk about this uh jimmy you're looking at these ppms private placement memorandums and these guys have got these pro forma offerings to you and they're saying here this is what we're going to do how do you analyze those and how much how much credence do you give those do you actually believe them or do you just look at them and make your own analysis um well, you mentioned the lead earlier, and and, and I'll I'll answer that first. With it kind of it depends on the lead. Um, you know, the experienced leads that have been doing this for for a good amount of time and have, have taken a, a measured approach and aren't moving too quickly, um, they get a lot of credibility with me. So um, I generally do believe certainly their their NOI projections. Um, and from there, I'm, I'm I'm looking at you know, you know, if they're uh, the property age and location, if they're if they're saying they're going to take a, a C property up to a B, is that really feasible given the age and location of the property? Because you know, some properties in some locations are always going to be a C, so you know, I'll kind of discount that in my mind sometimes. Um, you know what are they doing with their cap rate projection? Are they are they keeping it level? Are they increasing it to be really conservative? Or are they are they dropping it? And you know if they're dropping the cap rate, that loses some credibility with me. So um, those are kind of the key uh, low hanging fruit, if you will, things that that jump out to me uh, on some deals. All right. Well, let's talk then about your strategic plan. Uh, when you started in 2017, you said, okay, you know, I'm going to give up on the being the lead thing, I think, for now and go ahead and see what I could do as a passive. And then you went ahead and retired yourself in that form. The question right. I have for you is how did you see um, your plan as to far as to invest? In other words, we're looking at how much in each deal, how far apart, location, lead, you know, diversification. What was your plans? How did you see that? Um, yeah, my approach was to do, um, you know, try to do two to three deals a year um, and, and, and invest, kind of spread it out a little bit from that standpoint so that, the, 
you know, so that the cash flows, um, you know, spread out that way. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you get a, a an offer to sell a lot a, a lot sooner than you expect, and then you've got that money to redeploy. But my overall goal was to be kind of an, have a rolling um, portfolio of of around ten deals. To me, that was sort of enough diversification, um, and it allowed me to put more money in each deal. Um, and because I was doing that, I've never had a problem getting in a deal. If you're putting in more than the minimum, you're going to get in a deal. Um, so that was that was kind of my my view there. Um, I would, you know, some I might have taken a little bit of aggressive approach from the standpoint of of I do not always fully redeploy my capital events, but I have you know, my own projections going forward sort of telling me, you know, how much I need to hold back and how much um, I should go in and invest. And that allowed me to retire probably a couple of years earlier than if I'd waited to just purely live on um, quarterly distributions, if that makes sense. No, it doesn't. That's an interesting point. Let's, <laughs> let's uh, peel the onion back on that one a little bit, because that is interesting, because you were talking up front about it being very difficult to replace the large amount of income you were making. So you came up with a twist that um, I did not know of, or I don't know of until you explain it to me. <laughs> Go ahead and sh okay. share with us. <laughs> sure. So, well, well, first, I didn't fully replace my income. I just, you know, we have enough, because um, we were never really living on, on our full income. I was, I was taking you know, uh, on average about half of it and, and putting it towards towards these investments. So we've just stayed with that. Um, for us, have a fairly conservative um, expense budget. And, um, you know, these, you know, investing in deals with, with conservative projections, I, you know, when I believe those projections, I, I put them into my own, you know, forward-looking forecast. And, um, you know, make sure that I'm, you know, as through the cash flows and the expected capital events that I'm going to have enough money in each year going forward to, to, to meet our expenses. So that's, that's been my approach. That is unique, Jimmy. That is, I've never heard that before in 34 years of doing this. That's really unique. That is, that is as type B as you can get right there. <laughs> <laughs> and you that's see a, my spreadsheet. <laughs> and that's a good thing. <laughs> that's amazing. So you really, you look at these things and you pencil out how much you're making in the future if, of course, they hit the projections and so forth. And that way you know where you're going to be each year. So you can say, hey, I got something coming up here. This deal is going to be sold. I need to replace that. So you start looking to rearrange. That's interesting, man. That really, I mean, I got people that have got, tons and tons of deals, but they've never sat down and figured it out in that direction as to what do I need. They're always looking at what do I have and what will I get. And that, by the way, that's the way I look at it. What do I have and what's it going to give me? But not what will it give me a year, two years, three years, four years from now. That's To me, that's a unique one. So I'm going to give that one to you. We're going to call that the Jimmy Mayfield spreadsheet. There we go. <laughs> we, we might have to get you up on stage and share that with people. All right, we're going to have a giant B class, class for Bs only. It's called the Jimmy Mayfield spreadsheet. How to plan your future on only three pages of Excel or less, right? I'd be happy to share that. I put a guy up there one time uh, with Curtis, and this guy was explaining his spreadsheets. And he had like seven spreadsheets to analyze the results of, of his passive deals. And I took him off the stage because I didn't know what his thing was going to be. I said, look, nobody is going to understand what you're saying, nor is anybody going to do any of this. Uh, mm -hmm. And I made him get down and have Curtis just tell people what normally people do. Uh, but, I mean, <laughs> that guy had ungodly stuff. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Jimmy Mayfield and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show.
with a roadmap to creating the lifestyle you really want. Keep listening. The Del Wamsley Radio Show returns in moments. What is Del Wamsley, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, up to in today's market? I'm out there right now looking and buying everything I can get my hands on for a better deal, a better deal than what I could get it for a week before. And I'll just keep buying. I did that back in 2008. I bought a property that's worth $35,000 a door. I bought it for $26,000 a door. Next month or so, I bought the same age property, and I bought it for like $19,000 a door. But by buying at 26 when they were getting killed from 35 down to 26, buying at 26, let the broker know I was a buyer in a downward spiraling market. And so from that point on, I bought three or four more. I can't remember exactly. I, mean, I think it was four more I bought from there. And the brokers were just bringing them to me. Go, look, you seem to be the only guy buying right now. Are you ready to take advantage of the wave of opportunity coming to those who know what they're doing? Join us for the free online workshop at lifestylesunlimitedworkshop.com. You're hearing the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Want more life-changing knowledge? Access our podcast and listen on demand at lifestylesunlimited.com under the radio tab. Now your host, Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today on Tell Dell Tuesday is Jimmy Mayfield out of Atlanta, Georgia. And Jimmy is uh, rocking around 1,922 units right now. Uh, I've been doing this since 2000, actually before 2017, but really got deep into it around 2017 and knocked it out to where he was able to retire in a few years. Um, Jimmy, when you said that one of the most important things you got out of the experience was the re-evaluation of what or the definition of what retirement was. Can you share that with people, why that was so important, what that did for you to make it all make sense and work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So when I joined, I was uh, 42 and really had no real plan on how I was going to retire at that point. Don't tell my wife because she probably thinks I did. But... um, (laughs) You know, I just assumed that I would, you know, you know, in the next however many years it took, just just build up my pile of money and and, um, you know, live on that into retirement. Um, but what really stuck out at me, as I said, in the in the free um, you know, introductory seminar was was the idea of building these streams of income um, to live on instead of instead of that pile of money, which you just, you know, whittle down over the years. And that made so much sense to me because you can build those streams of income into perpetuity and you don't have to worry about, you know, outliving your money. So that was a real epiphany for me. Well, you brought it up. Let's go ahead and touch base on it then. And I'll come back to where we're at right now. And cause, just because you brought it up and that was, what did your wife think when you brought all this craziness to her? Um, I think it was a, you know, that was maybe a benefit of, of my work background is that she really trusted me to understand and and do um, what we need to do here. And, I mean, she's not involved at all and doesn't want to be, but, but you know, she's like, you know, you go get it, honey. Bring that money home. So um, <laughs> so that was kind of a, a, a benefit of, of my, my background, um, you know, was that was that trust factor. So. Gotcha. So let's go back then. We'll, we'll skip back. That was short and to the point. Uh, go do it. <laughs> leave me, right. leave me alone. <laughs> Just bring the money home. I like that. Uh, the only so, caveat she said was, "Okay, but first you got to set aside the girls' college money." So there. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah. So let's go back to when you were spending time with me. I remember going to lunch with you. By the way, I don't know if you remember that or not, but we went to lunch. But you were at the two day. What? If any epiphanies did you get that said, my gosh, I've been right in the middle of this forever. That point right there makes it real to me. I can do it. What 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 epiphanies did you get, if any? You know, because you're in the business. It's, it's just yeah. shocking to me. You sit there and something just goes, man, why, why did that just pop up? Well, you know, really, I mean, everything in the seminar 
just made sense to me and I had had seen it and there wasn't anything that was um, that was new information. It was just for the first time me sort of seeing it presented um, in that way as a, as a method of, you know, a wealth building method and, and exactly why it works um, so well in, in the way that it works. And, and also, like I, like I said earlier, you know, looking around the room, you know, packed full of people who were, who were looking to do the same thing and sort of realizing, look, here's a, here's a built-in networking group for me. Cause I'm not a great, not a great networker. I'm not a super outgoing person. Um, but having that sort of, you know, ready-made, uh, program, if you will, was, was really gave me a lot of comfort in, in moving forward. That's interesting. Um, I'm going to throw something at you. This is just between you and I with the world listening. But uh, I just went to a, a two-day, for the first time in a long time, just this last weekend, and I walked in, and there's only like 30 people in the room. That does not inspire confidence. I ask, how can we only have 30 people? We normally have anywhere from 70 to 100. That's a typical room that you would have been in. And they go, well, there's 60 or 80 people online. <laughs> Since we had COVID, everything's gone online. I go, that is too weird. You know, to get up there and talk to 30 people, you know, you know, there's 100 people listening to you, but it doesn't, like you said, inspire the confidence that there's this is really real, first of all, and that there's that networking event. Would that have freaked you out or do you understand that there's, would the average person understand that there's people online watching this or not? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I love the live events. I prefer going to live events. I had a great time at the expo. I, I'm, I'm sure I shook you know, over a thousand hands and had that many conversations. Um, you know, so I love the live events from the standpoint of sort of a, the, the sort of forced networking, also the, the ability to sort of step aside and have, have side conversations. But, um, no, I think that's, that's, you know, I'm not sure what to say about the, the lower in-person attendance. Cause that wouldn't, that wouldn't be me. I'm, I'm more of an in-person kind of guy. Yeah, I am too. So I just wondered what you'd say. Uh, the world just listened into us having a private conversation. <laughs> right. So, uh, 2017, you decided to kick it in. 2019, somewhere around there, you retired at only 54 years of age. Um, are those numbers kind of right? Is that close? Yeah, 2020. Yeah, that's when I, I left my job. Yep. So, three years. And it looks like here you're saying your average internal rate of return on all this stuff uh, has been 27.8 percent over that period, starting back. And this was that was you were throwing in stuff back from 2011 or first started the first initial. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's a pretty heavily skewed average because the <laughs> the return on my 2011 deal has been just just phenomenal. So on on the newer deals, I've averaged a little over 16 percent. What about your family? I know you said your wife was on board as long as you took care of the daughter's college degree. What about your family? Did they think you were crazy leaving those great that great job, the W two income? I'm talking about your parents, her parents, the you know, family members that always have an opinion type thing. Yeah, it's kind of a um, maybe a little a little ironic because nobody's really surprised that I'm doing this. But when I try to get them to join their maybe a little standoffish because they're like, well, of course you can do it, you know, get, look at your background, uh, but, um, you know, it's a little harder convincing them that they can do it. That makes a lot of sense. Really? Actually, you know, I see that I get the same thing. You know, I don't try to tell anybody in person that they should do real estate because they look at me and go, of course you can do it. You know, duh. it's easy. You get all that money. You go, well, how do you think I got all that? <laughs> it doesn't seem to it doesn't tie together very well for the average person. It's like they think I've been you know wealthy my whole life. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the family. Um, let's talk about coworkers. I always like to hear what the coworkers. I mean, you, how do you leave in, in your early fifties or late forties? How do you just leave your job and say I'm going to go do what they're doing? Well, how can you do real estate, Jimmy? We're doing real right. estate. That's not real estate. We're doing real estate. We're in real estate. What you know? What do they think about all that? Well, I think one thing that that helps is that that working in the lending industry stinks. 
I mean, it's, it, it pays really well, but it's 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 a high stress and, and high conflict. So, you know, the people, you know, my closest peers um, in, in the industry sort of kind of knew where I was coming from and in, in, in looking for an exit. And and the ones that I, you know, still in touch with, they're obviously, you know, somehow they, they still can't see themselves doing it, but I think they're they're happy for me that I've that I've been able to make it work. Now, why can't they see themselves doing it? They're in the middle of the same business. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't really put my my finger on. You know, I think they're just they're just comfortable, and they're still, you know, their four hundred one k IRA focused and and just going down that road still. So. Um, I can't put my finger on it either. You know, if you were at the expo yeah. this year, right? Yep. You know, so you saw my uncle. Just huh, crazy yeah. as crazy as bat crazy can be, right? And he uh, here he is a college professor, and he's an entrepreneur. And my dad, on the other hand, is an accountant slash runs a company for another guy, worked for him for 30, 40 years running his company, he never would go out on his own and do his own company. Just could not see himself as an entrepreneur. It just didn't click. So I guess there's just some people that just don't have the personality for it, maybe. Uh, although it doesn't take a lot of personality to be a passive investor, does it? Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been super easy. <laughs> uh, you're in the real world, Jimmy. i got to throw something at you. Uh, because you're in, you come from the real world, if you were to talk to somebody in the outside world and say, okay, I need to raise... Ten million dollars capital. How hard would that be for them to go raise ten million bucks? Yeah, I, I, I don't even know how to answer that. That just, it just seems like such an such an impossibility. I mean, obviously, I've I've seen it. I mean, you know, there's lots of syndicators outside of of lifestyles, and and almost every single one of them is a great marketer. You know, it's mm-hmm. outside of lifestyles to be a syndicator. It's more important that you be able to sell than it is that you be that you be able to operate and that's that's another thing that sort of attracted me to lifestyles is that focus on on operations and doing things the right way and and you know going back to the to the the white paper you know protecting protecting the limited partner you know the passive investors so um you know like i said i've seen it done outside of lifestyles but but for someone who is not a um, you know, a great marketer and, and able to build that marketing platform, it's definitely more difficult. Did you happen to go on the bus tour this year at the um, Expo? I did. I went on the on the second day. All right. So on the second day, we got to see – oh, wait, I don't know which ones you went to see. But one of the leads brought up this point. He said – and by the way, it was the one with the guy that had the storage units. I don't want to give out his name, but do, do you remember the one with the storage units with the green doors on the storage units? That must have been on the first day. I didn't. I didn't. Oh, okay. I, well, they they were on both days, but it was just a matter of which which group of properties. Oh, okay, yeah, I didn't see that property. So, okay, he uh, he said, "Look, uh, I just want to let you understand this. I bought this place and I needed ten million dollars, and I had to be able to close this thing rapidly. And so I put out my, you know, list put out to my list that I needed to get this deal done, and I raised ten million dollars in one day." That's the power of the group. And we've had a couple times where we've had a couple $20 million raises and a $10 million raise all going at the same time. And people are like, you know, wow, can we actually raise that much capital in a short period of time? And we've done it. So it's amazing the difference between being in that outside world out there and being in here. So as a lead, Jimmy, you get that list together now before you get that deal, before you find your deal, you get ready to go, and then, boom, you pull that trigger. Are you in, um, uh, what's it called, the software program for leads? Yeah, uh, yeah Podium. I'm on, the, yeah. I'm on the, the Podium celebration list, and that's that's been magical, Dale. I, I joined in. Uh, I, I got on Podium in the middle of January, and, you know, of course, I, I went to the expo, and, and you know, I've got at this point over 400 people who are who are in, interested in investing with me in my first deal. Great. Well, it looks like to push us out the back end, Jimmy. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your story with the rest of you out there. Remember this: it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. Have a wonderful day.
The information and opinions you hear on the Dell Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Dell Wamsley, his guests, and his callers. The Dell Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Dell Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.